Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. So in this video, we are going to discuss Geeks for Geeks, problem of the day and today's problem is shortest source to destination path and it's a medium level problem. So for the past two days, we have been getting some graph traversal problems. So we got first BFS and then DFS and today's problem is just a simple application of BFS. So if you understand what is the core idea behind BFS, you will understand this problem very easily because this is just an implementation of the idea used in BFS. So the problem statement says that we have been given an into M matrix and we have to start from cell 0 comma 0 and go to cell X comma Y. And there is one constraint that we can only move through cells that contain uh, one. So we are allowed to move in four directions, left, right, up and down. We can only go through cells containing one. So these are our only two constraints. And when we move from one cell to another, right, to it adjacent cell, so this is counted as one step, right? So we have to find the minimum number of steps required to reach from 0, 0 to x, y. This is our whole question. So to say this problem simply, we have to find the shortest path, right? And uh, the expected time and space complexity is both n into m. So let us see how we can solve this particular problem. As I've already said, that shortest path, finding the shortest path, shortest path. This is just an application of BFS, right? This is one of the most useful applications of BFS. So let us recall what did we study in BFS. We said that if we have a node, right? If we have some nodes like these. So if you're starting from this particular node, then we are only going to traverse all of its neighbors at once, right? All of its neighbors means all of its immediate neighbors, right? So this one is the neighbor of the root node, this one is the neighbor and as well as this one is the root node, right? So let us say that the distance of this particular node is D, right? So what will be the distance of these nodes? You must have guessed it right, it is equal to D plus 1, right? So just assume for now that this edge is of weight 1, right? So that I can denote that when you move from one node to another that it costs one step, right? So if you are at any node and its distance is d from the source node, then all of its neighbor, all of its neighbors will definitely have a distance d plus 1, right? And one of its neighbor will be like this also, which, which will act as a parent. So you will realize, let's say source was somewhere here and there are some nodes in between and then we come to this particular node whose distance from the source node is d minus 1. Then you move on to the next node, it is equal to d. Then you move on to the next node, it is equal to d plus 1, right? So for very obvious reasons, you are not going to set the distance of this previous node to d. Why? Because this node, this node occurred before this particular node, right? So this is acting like a parent or in that particular problem, we maintain a visited array, right? So this is similar to the visited array that since we have already visited this node, this upper node, we are not going to update its distance. Right, or we are not going to push it back into the queue. So the distance of this particular node being less than this particular node actually denotes that this node was visited before the next node. Why is this true always? Because if you are starting from one node, visited all of its neighbors, let's say this is at distance 0 and then this is at distance 1. So you can only achieve nodes of distance 2 from one of these three nodes. Right, so when you extend these three nodes, only then you will be able to achieve a node with distance 2. Right. So you see the nodes with a smaller distance are always visited before the nodes with a greater distance. Right. And now using the same property that we are only going to visit, let's say we have a node with a distance of D, we are going to visit all of its neighbors together. So all of them will have a distance D plus 1. So this is how it is easier. It is easier to calculate the distance with the help of BFS. And you will always see in every case this distance is always going to get incremented by 1 at each stage, right? Because let's say there was a node at distance 0, you visited all of its neighbors with distance 1 and then you will take this particular node, you will visit all of its neighbors which will be now at distance 2. You will take this particular node and you will visit all of its neighbors which is now at distance 2. So you will realize that all of these nodes, all of these nodes are getting updated one by one. So all of the nodes at distance 1 will get updated then all of the nodes at distance 2 will get updated, then all of the nodes at distance 3 will get updated and so on. 
Now let us see what is the difference between DFS and DFS if we try to find the shortest path. So let's say this is the graph. Right. This is the graph. Right. So you will see if I try to do DFS, right. So let's say I am at this particular node, then I went to this particular node. So its distance is 0. Now the distance of this node will be 1. So I go here, the distance of this node will be 2. The distance of this node will be 2 and then again the distance of this node will be 3. So I have updated all of the distances. Right. Now when I go to this particular node, its distance will be 1. And when I check the neighbor of this particular node, its distance is actually greater than the distance it, it is supposed to have. Right. So if I go from this node to the next node, its distance should be 1 plus 1 that is equal to 2. Right. And it is currently 3. So for the current scenario, I can even update its distance, right? So let's say I updated the distance of this node as 2, right? And it will still work, right? So till here it was fine, there was no problem. What I did was I did a DFS and whenever I find out that the current distance of the node is greater than the expected distance, I'll update its distance, right? Very, very simple. But the problem arises when this node is extended further. Right. And let's say there, is a, there are a lot of nodes. So initially, let's say its distance was 3. So its distance will be 4, then 5, then 6, and these two will be at 7. Similarly, this will be at 5, this will be at 6, and these two will be at 7 distance. Right. But as soon as I take this particular node and update its distance as 2, all of these nodes that are lying below will need to get their distance updated. Right. So all of their distance will get decremented by 1 in this particular case. And this is not very optimal, right? If there was only a single node, then it would not have been a problem. But since there can be multiple nodes behind it also, so as soon as you update the distance of the current node, the distance of all the nodes behind it will also need to be updated, right? So this is the problem with DFS and I've already explained how BFS solves it. You will always see that if you do any dry run in BFS, you will always see at all the nodes which are at a distance 1 will get updated first, right? And all the nodes which are at a distance 2 will get updated after, after these nodes. And then all the nodes which are at distance 3 will get updated after these nodes. So it will always occur in a sequential order, right? This is what is special about BFS. So this is exactly what we also saw here. In this particular case, we realize that all the nodes with distance d minus 1 will be visited before all the nodes with distance d, right? So this, this condition will always get satisfied and this will help you to always get the shortest path of every node. So now you just have to do a simple BFS and there are some little conditions here and there that you have to take care of. So till now we have discussed a very general idea of how to do BFS to find the shortest path. But now let us discuss some specifics related to this particular problem. So this particular problem actually has a grid. So if you have not done grid BFS or grid DFS before, let me just quickly explain you how you can do this. So let's say this is your grid and for each and for each cell, you can either go upwards, you can either go left, you can go down and you can go right. Right. So is it equivalent to a graph? Yes, it is equivalent because each cell is denoting a node, right? And each node is connected to at most four other nodes, right? So we know what are the nodes, we know what are the edges. So there is no problem in forming a graph and solving this particular problem with the help of a graph. So whenever you see a grid like this, you can always solve it with a graph algorithm, right? Now let us uh, discuss one very interesting method of traversing through a grid. I have mentioned this particular method multiple times in my videos, but if you already don't know it, let me just discuss it quickly. So let's say there are four directions up, down, left and right, right? So let's say this is x1, this is x2, this is x3, these are denoting the rows, this is y1, this is y2 and this is y3, these are denoting the columns, right? So if I move upwards, what will happen? My x will get decremented by 1 and y will remain as it is. If I move downwards, my x will get incremented by 1 and y will remain as it is. If I move left, x will remain as it is and y will decrement by 1. If I move rightwards, x will remain as it is and y will increment by 1. 
right so you see each value is either getting incremented or decremented by one so what i'll do what i'll do i'll create a dx array right so dx means basically the change in position of x so i'll mark these values as minus 1 1 0 and 0 so you must be wondering what are these values you see x is getting decremented by 1 so i have taken minus 1 x is getting incremented by 1 so i have taken 1 and in all the other cases it is 0 now similarly i can create dy and i have to take the corresponding values of y so here it is 0 the change in y is 0 the change in y is 0 here as well here the change in y is minus 1 and then 1 finally so if i am at a current position let's say x comma y i can find the new position as x plus dx of i and y plus dy of i and i will be any integer from 0 to 3 right because there are four indexes so it will be from 0 to 3 so if i do this i traverse through the values of i from 0 to 3 i will be able to find all of these four directions right so the first direction will be x minus 1 and y plus 0 then x plus 1 and y plus 0 right so this is exactly what we have got here so this is just a simple and clean way to write the same thing you could have also used if and else conditions it would have also done the same thing but this is just one cleaner way of writing the same code to making your code more readable right so this is all about today's problem of the day now let us discuss some more specifics after looking at the code and you will be able to understand how you can solve this mathematical problem so let us have a look at the code now so you see what i've done is if the initial position 0 comma 0 is itself equal to 0 that means we cannot even start our D bfs so that is why i directly return minus 1 from here now i create a double dimensional vector of size n cross m and initialize all the values with 10 to the power 9 uh, you can take any value which can never be the answer so in this problem you can see the maximum values of n and m are up to 250 so the maximum distance between any two nodes we can take a safe upper bound on that particular value to be 500 right why because uh, you can go at most 250 steps downwards and you can go at most 250 steps rightwards so it is i know it is not exactly 500 it will be some value lesser than 500 but let us for the sake of simplicity consider it to be 500 right so we have to guess a safe upper bound we can take any value greater than 500 here and it should work so let me also take 500 here this will prove that you can also take a smaller value now i've initialized my distance of, of 0 comma 0 as 0 and i've created a queue with pairs of integers so i push the first coordinate that is 0 comma 0 into my queue i've created a dx and dy array as explained and while my queue is not empty, I am just going to take the front element from the queue. So now my coordinates are stored in x, y and I pop it from the queue. Now I can traverse all the four directions by making a simple for loop from i0 to less than 4 and I can create the new direction as x plus dx of i and new direction ny as y plus dy of i. Now I check if, if this new direction or if this new coordinate is valid as well as the distance of this new coordinate is greater than the distance of the current coordinate plus 1. So I can go from x comma y to nx comma ny in one step, right? So if the total distance of this particular node is actually greater than this value, that means I need to update the distance of this node, right? So let us first see what is inside the valid function. This is just basic condition checking that uh, my new x and new y should not be out of bounds from the for the array. And if this new x and new y is equal to one, then I can return true, right? So if this is valid and this condition is satisfied, then I update the distance of new x and new y and I push this new x and new y into my queue. So, so at the end, I just check if the distance of x comma y is equal to 10 to the power 9. So let me just also take 500 here, right? So if this is equal to 500, that means I have not found a path from the source to this particular node that in that particular case, I can return minus one. Otherwise, I can return the distance of x comma y. So let me just quickly submit this and show you that this particular code works and this is absolutely correct. So you see passes all the test cases and the solution is correct. I hope that you guys were able to understand the solution. If you guys did, then consider dropping a like on this video and don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments because your engagement with this particular video really helps the YouTube algorithm to understand that this video is actually helpful for you and if you're able to reach more number of people like you who want to keep solving new problems. So I see a lot of people who watch these videos have not subscribed yet. In case you're one of them, then definitely consider subscribing. It's always free of course, and you can always unsubscribe if you don't find the videos interesting later. So share this channel with your friends. Until the next video drops, keep coding, stay safe, bye-bye.